On the news hour tonight, the U.S. versus Iran. Mourners gather across Iran to pay respect to the elite general the U.S. killed in an airstrike. A killing to which Iran's ambassador to the U.N. tells the news hour there would be a serious response. You have to take revenge. Uh, when that would happen, how that would happen, uh, where that would happen, that remains to be seen in the, in the future. Then, New Year, same impeachment. As Congress starts a new session, questions remain open for the president's impending Senate trial. And artists in exile, how the City of Light helps brighten the path for refugees, creating work far from home. When we are together, when we speak, when we share this story, keep fighting. It is good to have this place. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by for 160 years. BNSF, the engine that connects us. Fidelity Investments. American Cruise Lines. Consumer Cellular. The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. For more than 50 years, advancing ideas and supporting institutions to promote a better world at Hewlett.org. and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. In Iran today, an outpouring of grief and cries for vengeance. The U.S. killing of Iran's best-known military commander brought out vast crowds in Tehran as leaders on both sides fired off threats. Foreign Affairs correspondent Nick Schifrin begins our coverage. In a massive show of mourning and unity, hundreds of thousands of Iranians took to the streets today to grieve a man they called a martyr. Crowds rallied around trucks carrying the remains of Iranian Major General Qasem Soleimani, killed in a U.S. airstrike last Friday. Soleimani was not just uh, an Iranian uh, champion or a hero. He was a hero of all humanity. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, led funeral prayers, weeping over Soleimani's body. Soleimani's assassination has united the country very strongly, in a sense, because he was, uh, he didn't belong to any specific political party. Zainab Ghassami is a professor at the University of Tehran. She told us Soleimani's death had created unity, even among the regime's critics. He was a national hero who fought ISIS so uh, effectively. And even like among my students and colleagues, those who might be very critical of Iran's foreign policy, they are very much united over the issue of Soleimani's assassination. On Sunday, Iran announced it would no longer abide by the 2015 nuclear deal's limits, but it said it would continue cooperating with international inspectors. Europe is still in the deal, and today European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen pushed for a return to diplomacy. We are extremely concerned that Iran has announced it no longer feels bound by the deal. We see escalating violence, and that is why it is so important to break this developing cycle of violence and find room for diplomacy. As that violence escalated, U.S. officials tell PBS NewsHour that last Monday, President Trump hosted a National Security Council meeting in Florida, and his top military and diplomatic advisors cited intelligence of what they called an imminent threat and pushed a more aggressive option. 
By Thursday, the Pentagon had a plan. On Friday, a U.S. drone killed Soleimani outside the Baghdad airport. Over the weekend, President Trump delivered a specific threat, tweeting, let this serve as a warning that if Iran strikes any Americans or American assets, we have targeted 52 Iranian sites, some at a very high level and important to Iran and the Iranian culture, and those targets, and Iran itself, will be hit very fast and very hard. International lawyers say targeting cultural sites would be illegal under international law, but President Trump repeated the threat on Sunday. Quote, they're allowed to kill our people. They're allowed to torture and maim our people. They're allowed to use roadside bombs and blow up our people. And we're not allowed to touch their cultural sites? It doesn't work that way. The president also threatened Iraq. Quote, if they do ask us to leave, if we don't do it in a very friendly basis, we will charge them sanctions like they've never seen before. It'll make Iranian sanctions look somewhat tame. The president was responding to a non-binding Iraqi parliament resolution passed Sunday, calling on the Iraqi government to evict U.S. troops. The Iraqi government has an obligation to end the presence of all foreign forces on Iraqi soil and prevent it from using Iraqi land, water and airspace for any other reason. The vote leaves the long-term fate of 5,000 U.S. troops in Iraq in limbo. Those troops have been fighting ISIS and training Iraqi forces. Today, the military said the troops would be repositioned, but their mission is on hold. In a statement on Sunday, the U.S.-led coalition said it would pause the fight against ISIS to focus on protecting American troops. Defense officials tell PBS NewsHour that military commands around the world are increasing U.S. forces' protection as they brace for a possible Iranian response. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nick Schifrin. For the Iranian view of this crisis, I am joined now by Iran's ambassador to the United Nations. He is Majid Tak Ravanshi from New York City. Mr. Ambassador, welcome back to the news hour. As you know, the Trump administration, the United States government, is saying it was justified in targeting General Soleimani because not only had he killed many Americans, he was responsible for the grievous wounding of many more, the killing of many Syrians. They say that this was something the Americans were completely justified in doing. Uh, this is the fake information that is being provided by the administration. In fact, there is no truth in it. If the administration has any proof, uh, they have to uh, provide uh, this information to the general public, to the American people. What I can tell you is that General Soleimani was the champion of fighting ISIS and other terrorist organizations in Iraq and Syria. And today, those same terrorists are very happy with what the Americans did to General Soleimani. They are cheering, they are celebrating the demise of Martyr Soleimani. And all the things that are being said uh, about, uh, about General Soleimani is false. The U.S. administration, Mr. Ambassador, is also saying they have evidence that General Soleimani was planning more attacks imminently that would have led to the deaths of more Americans. Do you have proof that he was not doing that? I mean, it is the United States who should provide the proof. If they, if they have any proof that the, the threat was imminent, they should provide this uh, information to the American people. Even the members of Congress are not satisfied with the way that this information is being relayed to them. And they are not satisfied with the way uh, that uh, uh, this so-called uh, uh, imminent threat was being, uh, you know, conveyed to the American people. So there is no justification for the attack against uh, uh, General Soleimani. It was against international law. It was against the violation. Uh, it was the violation of... Uh, uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity of a U.N. member, namely Iraq. So there is no justification for that cowardly attack against uh, General Soleimani. What is your government prepared to do now? We have said that uh, we have to take the necessary measures. We have to take revenge. Uh, when that would happen, how that would happen, uh, where that would happen, that remains to be seen. In the, in the future. But, but we have to emphasize the fact that we are not interested in a war with the United States uh, or with anybody else. Uh, we are a peaceful country, but at the same time, we cannot just uh, remain silent. 
uh, we have to respond to the general public's demand in Iran. Uh, I'm sure you have seen the footages today, uh, the funeral, uh, you know, uh, ceremony in Tehran for, uh, for General Soleimani. Millions of people were uh, in, in, in the streets in Tehran, and all of them are demanding revenge. We, we cannot just remain indifferent to the calls by our public. And, and what does revenge mean? What is the goal of that? Is that to go after uh, the U.S. government, to go after the U.S. military, to go after American citizens, or, or what? No, we, are, we, we do not have any, any, anything against American citizens, uh, the people. Uh, but uh, that remains to be seen what would be the reaction from, from Tehran. As I said, there is uh, nothing can be said about the timing, about the place, or uh, how this is going to happen. But this is something that, that uh, uh, will be done. But could it mean the targeting of an individual? I'm, I'm not in a position to tell you what exactly uh, Iran will do, but, but uh, that, that is something that, that, uh, that has to be taken. And this is the demand, as I said, demand by the Iranian people, that, that they need something to be done by the government in order to retaliate the, the uh, unjust uh, killing of, of our beloved uh, you know, general. But, but, but does your government consider American officials, U.S. officials, now to be legitimate targets? Uh, as I said, I'm not, I'm not going to elaborate uh, on, 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 the, on the steps that Iran uh, will take. But, uh, but in, in general terms, uh, there will be revenge against, against the killing of, of General Soleimani. Another question, Mr. Ambassador. Your government has now announced that it is going to suspend any limits uh, that it had placed on its nuclear weapons uh, production program. Uh, why are you doing this? And does this literally mean now that your government feels you can move ahead with, with producing a nuclear weapon? No, we are not. We are not interested in, in having a nuclear weapon uh, because uh, we have a very clear, clear cut uh, religious uh, edict. Uh, by our supreme leader uh, prohibiting uh, uh, nuclear weapons. At the same time, uh, there is no place for nuclear weapons in Iran's defensive doctrine. Uh, therefore, uh, we, we, we do not want to have nuclear weapons. We are a member of NPT. Uh, we have said in the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, that Iran will not have nuclear weapons. But at the same time, JCPOA uh, it was a deal. It was a give and take. Uh, we have been, we had been doing our part for some time uh, with almost nothing in return. Unfortunately, the European partners, which uh, were supposed to uh, give us the benefit of the nuclear deal, uh, they didn't act in accordance with the deal. If Iran is given uh, the benefits of the deal, we will go back to the full implementation of it. Ambassador Majid Ravanchi, the U Iranian ambassador to the United Nations, thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll have more on Iran right after the news summary. Good evening. I'm Vanessa Ruiz. In for Stephanie Sai at PBS NewsHour West. We'll be back with Judy Woodruff and the full program after these news headlines. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says Democrats will introduce and vote on a war powers resolution on Iran this week. It requires congressional approval for any further U.S. military action. Now, the resolution is likely to pass the Democratic-controlled House, but a similar resolution could stall in the Republican-run Senate. The battle over a Senate impeachment trial of President Trump has taken a new turn. The president's former national security adviser, John Bolton, said today he would testify if he is subpoenaed. Minority leader Chuck Schumer said that Bolton's statement bolsters Democrats' demands for current and former White House officials to testify. Given that Mr. Bolton's lawyers have stated he has new and relevant information to share, if any Senate Republican opposes issuing subpoenas to the four witnesses and documents we've requested, they would make it absolutely clear they're participating in a cover-up. House Speaker Pelosi has withheld the articles of impeachment in an effort to pressure the Senate to call witnesses. But Republican Majority Leader Mitch McConnell renewed his criticism of that tactic today. 
even with a process this constitutionally serious, even with tensions rising in the Middle East, House Democrats are treating impeachment like a political toy, like a political toy, treating their own effort to remove our commander in chief like some frivolous game. We'll return to the impeachment fight right after this new summary. Well, the United States has sent an unspecified number of additional troops to Kenya after Al-Shabaab fighters killed a U.S. soldier and two American civilians on Sunday. The group, linked to Al-Qaeda, stormed the Manda Bay airfield near the Kenya-Somalia border. Dark smoke rose during an hours-long siege. The Pentagon said it does not believe the attack was tied to tensions with Iran. And in Afghanistan, U.S. Ambassador John Bass stepped down today after serving two years in Kabul. It comes amid peace talks with the Taliban and U.S. tensions with neighboring Iran. The State Department said the move was part of a normal rotation, but there was no word of a permanent replacement. Wildfire conditions have eased up a bit in Australia after intense weekend heat, but scores of fires continue to burn. All told, they've killed 25 people so far and hundreds of millions of animals. Dan Rivers of Independent Television News reports from New South Wales in Australia. Not even a week into 2020, and already this is a year no Australian will forget. This is what they're dealing with all across southeastern Australia. They're using every asset they've got, planes, helicopters, fire engines. The fire's ripped through here. This property at the back is gone. We've just talked to the owner. He's distraught. He doesn't know what's saved and what hasn't. His entire life possessions are inside. The wind suddenly veers to the south. The fire switches direction. And our only way out is now a treacherous gauntlet of fallen trees and flames. They call Australia the lucky country. Right now, it feels cursed. Rain has now brought some relief, but the fires might be whipped up again on Thursday. Kathy Bleacher has come back for the first time to what's left of her house. It's hard because it's hard, you know. I mean, it is just a house at the end of the day, but when you see it like this, you know, it's where you lived. It's your home. Yeah, it's a home. You might get a home. It's not just the human toll which is still being assessed here. There's also been a catastrophic ecological price for these fires which have ravaged 60,000 kilometres. At the village vet in Milton, they're trying to cope with dozens of burnt animals, like this brush-tailed possum. It's got significant burns on all its feet, its face, its ears are crinkled. It's probably got smoke inhalation. It's, it's in a bad way. Sadly, this young possum didn't make it. Another victim that has succumbed to Australia's bushfire crisis. That report coming from Dan Rivers of Independent Television News. The Trump administration will now include asylum seekers from Mexico among those being deported back to Guatemala. Reports today say they will now have to wait there for their claims to be processed, and the deported will now include families. It's all part of an agreement signed last year with Guatemala and implemented in late November. A 5.8 magnitude earthquake hit southwestern Puerto Rico earlier today, causing power outages and damaging dozens of homes. There are no immediate reports of casualties. All of this coming after a week of smaller tremors that began in late December. Former movie producer Harvey Weinstein facing trial today on charges of rape and sexual assault. He arrived at court in New York using a walker after recent back surgery for a hearing on pretrial motions outside some of Weinstein's 75 accusers and later a defense lawyer speaking on the eve of jury selection. The eyes of the world are on this trial, you know, and women's hopes and dreams of every time they've been assaulted and hurt and never had their voices heard or never had their day in court because 98% of rape convictions do not, rape trials do not end with a conviction for the predator. The government doesn't want our side to have a voice. I think they believe that their side of this story is the only one that matters and the only one that counts. And that's what this trial's for. This trial is to show uh, the jury, the state of New York, and the world that there's more to this than, than they would like everyone to believe. Meanwhile, Weinstein was indicted in Los Angeles today also on charges of rape and sexual assault. Borden Dairy Company filing for federal bankruptcy protection today. It is the second major U.S. dairy producer to take this step in the last two months. Borden cited rising costs and changing consumption habits. The company was founded in 1857 and employs 3,300 people nationwide. 
Still to come on the News Hour with Judy Woodruff, Senate Leader McConnell, Speaker Pelosi, and the battle over the impeachment trial of President Trump. Our Politics Monday team breaks down the primary race with less than one month before voting begins and much more. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. Now we return to our top story and the ongoing tensions with Iran. Nick Schifrin is back with a look at where this stands three days after the killing of General Soleimani. Judy, we look at how the killing has impacted the region and specifically Iran, Iraq, and the U.S., and we get two views. Ryan Crocker had an almost 40-year career, career as an American diplomat. He served as an ambassador to Iraq, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon. He's now a diplomat in residence at Princeton University. He was unable to make it to his studio tonight and joins us on the phone. And Nargis Bajoli is a professor of Middle East Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. She is the author of Iran Reframed, Anxieties of Power in the Islamic Republic. Welcome to you both. Thanks very much. Welcome to the news hour. Nargis Bajoli, let me start with you. We heard from the Iranian ambassador to the UN uh, earlier, uh, Judy's interview, talking about how he is his blaming European partners for not delivering enough for them to stay in the nuclear deal. Remind us, is this Iran closing the door on the nuclear deal? Well, I think it's important. I actually thought that after the assassination of Soleimani that they would uh, potentially completely pull out of the deal. What they announced on Sunday was uh, interesting because they haven't pulled out of the deal. Uh, and what they have decided to do is uh, stay within the framework of the deal and make it so that, as actually the ambassador said, if other parties to the deal come back to the table, he means mostly the United States, uh, and lift the sanctions against Iran, that they would be willing to, to go back to the, the full framework of the JCP. Um, the reason that he's blaming the Europeans, though, in this is that um, once the Trump administration began to impose maximum pressure and especially the economic sanctions against Iran, they were hoping that the Europeans would come uh, to their aid and uh, relieve some of those sanctions. And even though Europe has done the instex and tried to create a special uh, purpose vehicle to get around it, it still has not really taken off. And so I think that that's part of the reason that they've been blaming the Europeans for this. Uh, Ambassador Crocker, so a little bit of ambiguity ambiguity in how Iran is approaching this moment when it comes to the nuclear deal, but what are the implications of their further eroding the commitments that they once agreed to? I think that uh, if Iran were to pursue its uh, stated desire to pull out of the deal completely or to start violating all of its terms, uh, they would be making a major strategic mistake uh, that will alienate the Europeans and uh, many other countries around the world and has served to isolate Iran at a time when uh, they have said they are seeking international support against the United States for the uh, killing of uh, General Soleimani. So uh, from, from an American perspective, if, if they want to uh, draw negative attention uh, to them on this important nuclear matter, they're doing just the right thing. Nargis Bajoli, in terms of drawing attention or negative attention, as the ambassador just said, uh, Iran has clearly been trying to have some positive attention on it, uh, accusing the U.S. Uh, of, of an unlawful assassination. Um, and they have been trying to rally uh, their supporters across the region. What's the impact of Soleimani's death uh, on Iran across the region and on Iranian allies across the region? Yeah, I think. Uh I think the United States could not have made a bigger mistake as far as the person, the, the symbol of Soleimani is the, what he represented inside Iran and what he represented to Shia communities across the Middle East, I think, is something that is extremely important. And that's one of the reasons I think that uh, other American administrations, when they had the chance, did not assassinate Soleimani. But especially since 2013 and the fight against ISIS, it's important to remember that there was a very large media campaign. Uh, created in Iran, uh, sort of lionizing uh, Soleimani uh, and his fight against ISIS. Because again, it must be reiterated that ISIS's main goals at, uh, during its fight was to, um, and one of its main, its main enemies was the Shia. So uh, Soleimani was seen as this national figure who stayed above the politics of the country. So even when Iranians were very much against uh, the Islamic Republic and against a lot of the policies that the Islamic Republic has done, 
uh, he was sort of seen as, as being above that and, and uh, protecting the homeland from ISIS coming in. Ambassador Crocker, um, uh, Soleimani did take on ISIS and was seen, uh, of course, as a national figure inside Iran, but the Americans had a very different view of him, and, and certainly those uh, American troops, but also diplomats who served in Iraq, like you, had a different view of him, I take it. The uh, war between Iran and Iraq, uh, if, if that's how we're styling it, it, did not start with the killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani. It, it started ages ago in the early 80s with his predecessors and their proxies. I was in Lebanon at the time and uh, got to see up close and personal the bombing of the embassy. I was in it in 1983, again brought to us by uh, the uh, a, a predecessor of, of Soleimani. And, uh, uh, the militia that became Hezbollah. So General Soleimani, for two decades, has been heading uh, one of the most lethal uh, operating arms of the state we have ever seen. He has the blood of hundreds of American troopers in Iraq on his hand. Again, I got to stand at those ramp ceremonies, as we said, a final goodbye to dead soldiers. Uh, so there's no question that he was a, uh, a, a blood enemy, if you will. Uh, that All of that said, uh, we have to have a strategy here. Uh, this is a long war. It's gone on for years. It'll go on for years more at an increased level, I think, after the Soleimani assassination. So uh, the administration has to have a game plan, and that game plan will need to involve allies, a great deal of strategic patience, uh, the utilization of some very smart people uh, in the U.S. that know Iran uh, and uh, know how to uh, work with others None of these are hallmarks of this administration. So I, I worry very much that while taking a very bad actor off the field um, is not, in my view at least, inherently a bad thing, now what? And I, I'm not seeing any clear answers. Nargis Bajoli, what about for Iran? Now what? Where, where do they see this going and how might they respond? Yeah, I mean, um, look, a week ago, crowds like we saw the past two days in Iran were unthinkable because people were so angry at the state for the way it had cracked down against protesters in November. Uh, what the killing of, uh, of Soleimani has done is it has brought together the population in addition to not just his assassination, but also Trump's tweets about targeting Iranian cultural sites. So what do we see in the, I th in the future? Um, this has been a gift to the survival of the Islamic Republic. Uh, I think what we will see in the future is that uh, the Revolutionary Guard will uh, focus its mission on trying to get the U.S. forces out of the Middle East, and it now has, uh, and it has rallied forces both within Iran and outside of the borders to do so. And, Ambassador, uh, to you quickly in the time we have left, uh, there have been some fears within administration officials even that I've talked to, not only fear of unity within Iran, as Nargis Bajoli just said, but also fear of U.S. troops getting evicted from Iraq because of this strike. How concerned are you about that? I think the question of the U.S. presence in Iraq has a ways to play. The parliamentary resolution was uh, not binding, and the session was boycotted by uh, most Sunni and Kurdish deputies. There is no unanimity on uh, uh, the issue of U.S. presence in Iraq, partly because they know how crucial we were to the eviction of Islamic State. So I think it's time for uh, a pause. Everybody take a deep breath and see where we can go with this diplomatically. And I also think it's very important for the administration to do what it can to take Iraq out of the middle. Uh, uh, our president has, the Iraqi president has... Ambassador, I'm, I'm told that... Uh, sir, I'm sorry, Ambassador, I'm sorry to, to, to cut you off there, but I'm told we're out of time, uh, so I'll just have to thank you there. Uh, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, Ergis Bajoli, thank you very much. For two and a half weeks, the impeachment process against President Trump has remained, for the most part, frozen in place. Among the open questions, whether the Senate will hear witness testimony, despite John Bolton's statement today signaling his will willingness to testify under subpoena. All of this, even as Washington grapples with other serious foreign policy matters, as we've been hearing. 
Our own Lisa Desjardins and Yamiche Alcindor are here to break down where we are right now on so much of this. Hello to both of you. As always, it's a jam-packed uh, time for, uh, for news. Yamiche, I want to start with you. We did learn today that the president's former national security advisor, John Bolton, he put out the statement himself. He said, I'm willing to testify under subpoena. So the question is, how much does that matter and how much does it affect the, the, does the call by many Democrats for there to be more witnesses testifying? Well, former National Security Advisor John Bolton saying he's willing to testify if subpoenaed by the Senate is potentially a huge development, but it's potentially because we're not sure if we're actually going to see John Bolton subpoenaed by the Senate. The, of course, this is a Senate that is controlled by Republicans. I talked to some Democratic aides today who said this puts more pressure on Mitch McConnell to come forward because John Bolton had a front seat to many of the actions and meetings that led up to the impeachment of President Trump. But there are Republicans also who say they would be interested in seeing um, John Bolton testify, Senator Mitt Romney being one of them. But he stopped short, as many senators have, of saying that he would vote to subpoena John Bolton. That said, I want to remind people what John Bolton might be able to say if he was subpoenaed and, te and testified before the Senate. So here's some of the things. First, he objected very strongly to, you, to, to the Ukraine being pushed to investigate uh, Democrats. And he actually told an aide to alert White House lawyers to say, hey, Gordon Sondland, the European ambassador, and Mick Mulvaney, the acting chief of staff, they're trying to get this done. And he, he said, no, that we shouldn't be doing that. He also called the push to have Ukraine do these investigations a, quote, drug deal, and called Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal attorney, a hand grenade that would get everyone blown up. The other thing, he met personally with President Trump sometime in August to try to urge the president personally to withhold, to, 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 to let go of this aid um, and give it to Ukraine. So far, at that moment, he was unsuccessful successful in convincing President Trump to do that. But that's just three things that John Bolton can be mm. talking about, including much, much more. So, Lisa, you've obviously yeah. been talking to people on the Hill. What do we know about when this <laughs> Senate trial right. could start, assuming there's going to be one, and whether there will be any witnesses? Everyone, family members, crew members here at NewsHour is asking, <laughs> when will this trial start? And the truth is, we only know one thing. It will start exactly one day after Speaker Pelosi transmits the articles of impeachment and the list of House managers. That could happen as soon as this week, if she chooses to do that. However, Pelosi's office, talking to them today, and Misha's talking to Democratic aides as well, they do not seem feeling like they want to do that this week. They think that this John Bolton news adds to the pressure to try and push witnesses or an agreement for witnesses before the trial starts. And, you know, it's interesting, Judy, we talk sometimes about an audience of one, the president. Pelosi has an audience of four, four U.S. senators who will determine really whether witnesses are testifying or not. There you go, Alaska's Lisa Murkowski, Maine's Susan Collins, Mitt Romney, who Yamish mentioned, and Cory Gardner. They are all senators who some have said they're interested in hearing from John Bolton. They are swing senators. They say they want more information. But notably, Judy, they've all said they're okay with starting the trial without an agreement on witnesses. That's what Mitch McConnell mm. wants. So it looks like Mitch McConnell has the cards to start. It's just a matter of when Nancy Pelosi wants to make her move. Okay, we've only got about 45 seconds. Yeah. Big question here, war powers, conversation about Congress wanting to limit the president's ability to, to take military action. Where does that stand? There will be a vote in the House this week that we have to watch closely. It's not expected to go through the Senate, but that conversation will be important. A briefing on Wednesday for the Senate. And where does that stand from yeah. talking to the White House? For talking to the White House, this is really about the president not wanting to be hamstrung by Congress. But there are, of course, some cynical Democrats that say the president wants people to continue to talk about Iran because he doesn't want people to be talking about the impeachment trial and, and all the things that have been going on. Well, it's certainly taken 45 seconds. Away. We did it. Yeah. You did it in less than 45. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, uh, Yamish, in that the, we're not talking about uh, impeachment as much as we were. It's certainly not the lead tonight. But yeah. it's important. We're following it. Yamish Alcindor. Lisa Desjardins, thank you both. Welcome. Stay with us coming up on the News Hour. Crisis in Caracas. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro's attempt to capture control of the legislature. Plus, Paris's storied past and present as a haven for immigrant artists. They are some of the gravest questions candidates have to confront. Questions about the use of military force and how and when they would deploy 
if they become president. This weekend, the Democrats, hoping to unseat the current commander-in-chief, have been weighing in on his pivotal decision to strike out at a top Iranian commander. Amna Nawaz begins there. In a Democratic primary race dominated by domestic issues, it was issues of war and peace overseas this weekend that deepened fault lines in the field. War is the last response to international conflict, not the first. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders has been the sharpest critic so far of the Trump-directed airstrike that killed top Iranian military leader Qasem Soleimani. An Iraq war veteran in Dubuque, Iowa, asked Sanders how he would prevent another war in the region as president. Sanders, in warning against future U.S. involvement in the Middle East, highlighted his own record on these issues. I not only voted against the war in Iraq, I helped lead the opposition to the war in Iraq. In particular, a difference with former Vice President Joe Biden. Going to community college for Candidate Biden has been stressing his foreign policy experience on the campaign trail. In Des Moines this weekend, he claimed that he opposed the Iraq war, quote, from the very moment the Bush administration started that military campaign. I opposed what he was doing and spoke to it. But as senator in 2002, Biden voted for the war in Iraq, voicing his opposition in the years that followed. Biden agreed that Soleimani's alleged crimes warranted the U.S. targeting him. Still, Biden questioned the Trump administration's long-term Middle East strategy. This is a crisis totally of Donald Trump's making. Former Mayor Pete Buttigieg, a former naval intelligence officer who served in Afghanistan, took a similar approach. Now, let's be clear. Qasem Soleimani was a bad figure. Uh, he has American blood on his hands. None of us should shed a tear for his death. But just because he deserved it doesn't mean it was the right strategic move. We don't need more war in the Middle East. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, who walked back her initial strong support for the airstrike, this weekend questioned its timing. In an NBC interview, she suggested the president was trying to distract from other issues. We are not safer because Donald Trump had Soleimani killed. Uh, we are much closer to the edge of war. I think the pe question people reasonably ask is next week Donald Trump faces the start potentially of an impeachment trial. And uh, why now? I think people are starting to ask why now did he do this? So the this new questions about force and foreign affairs come less than one month before the Iowa caucuses. A new CBS News poll shows a three-way tie in Iowa among Sanders, Biden and Buttigieg, with Warren lagging in fourth. But she also got a boost today from a former primary rival. There's one candidate I see who's unafraid to fight like hell. To An endorsement from former Housing Secretary Julian Castro, who was the primary field's only Latino candidate before leaving the race last week. He is scheduled to join Warren on the trail tomorrow in New York City. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Amna Nawaz. And that brings us to Politics Monday. Here to analyze all this is Tamara Keith of NPR and co-host of the NPR Politics Podcast and Lisa Lehrer, a politics reporter for The New York Times. Hello to both of you. It is Politics Monday, but let's start with the story that, of course, is headlines everywhere still. It's, it's uh, still very much our lead, Tam, and that is the president's uh, move to strike uh, and kill a leading figure uh, in Iran. From a political standpoint, what does this tell the American people about the president's foreign policy, his strategy? Because he's someone who was saying we need to get out of endless wars, even get out of the Middle East, and yet this move to escalate. How, how is it being seen? Well, and, and his position on Iran, even, has been to have every position on Iran. He's gone from, uh, you know, saber-rattling language to saying that uh, he wants a deal, Iran wants a deal, maybe we can talk. Um, and and then this happened. He, he has truly been all over the place uh, about uh, foreign entanglements. Uh, though one thing is consistent, I went back over years of his statements, and, and his general uh, view is that if America is going to be involved in foreign wars or other entanglements, that 
they should get paid for it, essentially, that, that America should get the oil, America should get the money. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a view that he it, has toward Iraq policy and toward Syria and, and other countries, and, and that colors... It's a very transactional view of foreign policy, and it, covers, it cover, colors this as well, these decisions. Does it have an effect on his standing politically in, among voters, do you think? I think voters know where he is. They know that he's run both as someone who does not want to end foreign wars, but also wants to bomb the expletive out of ISIS. In fact, I think that ability to be move between those two messages is really a core part of his appeal. He can appeal to, you know, two very different elements of the Republican Party base. So I don't think this necessarily damages his standing. But Look, we don't know how this is all going to play out. There are a lot of uncertainties here. And what happens next and how uh, the Iranians respond, how the Middle East is, you know, if that gets, if that conflict gets mm -hmm. reshaped, will matter immensely to his reelection. And interesting, at this point, Tam, Republicans seem to be backing the president. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, they split with him uh, on his uh, move to uh, let Turkey go into Syria and and uh, to have an, have an initiative against the Kurds, who are longtime U.S. allies. But when it comes to this, uh, you know, having a hard line against Iran is very much in line with Republican orthodoxy. A lot of mm -hmm. President Trump's foreign policy is outside of Republican orthodoxy, and that's why he's gotten so much pushback on things like Russia and Syria. But here, he's very much in line with the way Republicans have, have uh, viewed Iran. So, Lisa, let's talk about the 2020 Democrats, mm -hmm. and we just heard some of that in Amna's report, what, where they're coming down on this. Is this likely to in any way shape... We are less than a month from the Iowa right. caucus, first votes, to have an effect on the race, to sh reshape this race somehow? Well, it's really hard to say, right, because there is just so much going on. Remember, before we were talking about Iran, we were talking about impeachment, and we're likely to come back to that this week. So these things are moving so quickly, and it, you don't hear a ton of questions when you're out with these candidates about impeachment, about Iran. The questions remain largely what they've been for the past you know, a year or so, which is health care, college, you know, cost of college, climate change, and electability, which is the main thing for a lot of Democratic voters. But I do think this could strengthen the hand of two men that have been leading the polls for a while, that have been rising in the limited data we have since the holidays, which is uh, Joe Biden, who can run very strongly on his experience uh, mm. in foreign policy, and Senator Bernie Sanders, who's really staked out ground as the liberal messenger, sort of the anti-interventionist uh, face of the party. So this could give a boost to either one and, of their With campaigns. distinct, distinct views right. on this. Right. And, and one other person who, in that recent poll, was up there at the top, all right. sort of tied right. with the, the 23, 25 percent, is Pete Buttigieg who mm -hmm. uh, is a, a, an Afghanistan war veteran and has been trying to use this moment right. to boost himself and, and to argue for his electability. What do you make of this Iowa poll that, that we were just reporting, that you now have three individuals, no longer Elizabeth Warren, interestingly. Right. She's lost a little bit of ground there, uh, uh, Tam and Lisa. I mean, what do we make of this? I think the race remains unbelievably fluid. You have these these three guys at the top. Elizabeth Warren, while she's fallen, is still in the mix. Amy Klobuchar, by some accounts, may be in the mix in Iowa. It, it, this is a race that, from that poll, and a lot can change in a month, of course, could go on for quite a while. You could have different winners of that first four early voting states. We're a month out from Iowa, and to me, it remains very unsettled. Right, and then you have Michael Bloomberg, who's invested right. just massive right. amounts yeah. of money uh, looking past those early states. So if it's like a, if if it isn't a clear decision coming out of those early states, then you head into Super Tuesday when there's a huge uh, number of people voting, and you have Michael Bloomberg, who's invested a lot of money. Now, and whether you can actually skip those early states and not right. be overtaken by momentum is a very open question. But Republicans, the Trump campaign, is looking at this and just sort of like hoping that it turns into this extended fight. But the Bloomberg ads that he's running, which we're seeing everywhere mm -hmm. because he's spending millions of dollars, they're going after Donald Trump, many of them. Right. It's a, in some ways, that's been helpful for the party because it allows them to get out there and really target Donald Trump at a time when they have a very... Um, sort of messy primary going on. Uh, what's unbelievable about what's, uh, Michael Bloomberg is that we've just never seen anyone spend this much money. Uh, if he continues on this pace, he will have spent by Super Tuesday the same amount that Barack Obama spent in his entire general election mm -hmm. on ads. So we don't know. Traditionally, yeah, entering the race late is a bad idea, but we just don't know 
um, how this is going to play out because we haven't seen it before. And that's a lot of what we're seeing in this race. It's very unpredictable. Unprecedented. And, and we should say Super Tuesday. We all, we all know when it is, but it's <laughs> right. early March. Right. It's just two months from now. And what your point is, he's spending more than President Obama spent in the entire, yep. in the entire campaign year. Just a quick note to make here that I want to uh, uh, point out for our viewers at the end. We did learn today that uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, in a meeting today with the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, announced that he is not going to run for the Senate in the state of Kansas, something that many Republicans had been urging him to do, Pat Roberts stepping back from the Senate. So, so much to watch. Thank you both, Lisa Lara, Tamara Keith, Politics Monday. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. As Venezuela's steep slide into economic disaster accelerates, major political upheaval continues to roil the nation. The opposition to President Nicolas Maduro took another hit in the National Assembly yesterday, and the leading opposition figure found himself literally on the outside looking in. With support from the Pulitzer Center, special correspondent Marsha Biggs reports from Caracas. Chaos in Venezuela's National Assembly for a vote that was supposed to be a foregone conclusion. Lawmakers had gathered for the annual election of new leadership in parliament. And the projected favorite? Rieta, Rieta. Incumbent Speaker Juan Guaido, who last year declared the presidency of Nicolas Maduro illegitimate. Invoking the constitution, he claimed his role as de facto president and won the support of 58 countries around the world, including the U.S. But he's failed to take control of the country. The vote stalled for hours yesterday, and tempers flared as members of parliament waited for Guaido's arrival, as National Guard troops blocked his entrance. Then, without him, a faction of supporters loyal to Maduro seized the floor, and by a quick show of hands and no formal vote, they declared a winner. And that's when the chaos erupted both inside and out. It's been an incredible scene here. We're standing out in front of the National Assembly Palace where Guaido was just voted out, but only because he was stuck outside the gate with his supporters unable to get in to vote. The National Guard holding him back. Supporters of Guaido rushed the gate, screaming that the country had become a dictatorship. Guaido himself even tried to jump the fence with troops beating him back. Meanwhile, the National Assembly dispersed with their newly elected leader, this man, Luis Para, an opposition member willing to negotiate with Maduro. The U.S. was quick to condemn the election, but President Maduro seized on the results. The National Assembly has made a decision, and there is a new leadership group from the opposition headed by Congressman Luis Para from the First Justice Party. Outside the palace, Maduro supporters rallied. But that wasn't the end. Across town later that evening, Guaido held his own vote, bringing together enough members of parliament to garner the 84 votes required to win re-election. I swear before God, before the Venezuelan people, to fulfill this constitution, the inherent duties of the position of president of the parliament and interim president of Venezuela, to enforce the rights of our Venezuelan brothers and sisters. Big promises for a country which yesterday had two competing presidents. Now today, dueling parliaments as well. And all this as the country spirals further into a failed state. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Marcia Biggs in Caracas. Refugees from the Middle East and from Africa have been settling in Europe in recent years, igniting anti-immigrant tensions. But one program in Paris is helping some refugees find a new community in France through art. Jeffrey Brown reports from Paris. It's part of Canvas, our ongoing arts and culture coverage. Portraits of migration, the troubles faced along the way, the trauma of making a new home. I'm from Afghanistan, but sometimes I say I'm from nowhere. <laughs> Photographer Abdul Sabour experienced it himself. 
In Afghanistan, he says, he worked in transportation for the U.S. Army, but fled when the Taliban began threatening him and his family. During a harrowing two-year journey, part of it spent in an abandoned train station in Serbia, he began taking pictures with a donated camera. When I showed to the people, I said, that's not normal how we live there. His photographs became a bridge to overcome language and other barriers and raise awareness about the plight of refugees, which he continues to do in Paris. After the people published the pictures and they did some exhibitions, people was asking what you guys need and they were sending some support. And then I said, it's really important. Sabor is one of some 200 refugee artists from more than 40 countries, now getting support from the Agency of Artists in Exile. On our visit to its makeshift building off the Sen River, an Ethiopian man belted out a traditional song with accompaniment from his phone. Across the hall, a Yemeni woman used her vast trail of official asylum-seeking papers, accumulated over two years of navigating France's legal process, to create an art installation. It was my first week in France, and the first day without documents. And a Kurdish actor who fled Turkey practiced a monologue about his first days in Paris. Can you imagine to leave your country tomorrow and to leave everything? Mm -hmm. Judith Dupaul is director of the studio, which opened in 2017 with funding from the French Ministry of Culture. In the beginning, you are like uh, in the state of shock. When you arrive here, you're in shock. Yes, because uh, nobody wants you there. It's difficult. You have to do a lot of papers. You don't understand nothing. And it's like, I don't know, it's like a panic. Like many countries in the West in recent years, France has struggled with rising tensions over an influx of refugees. President Emmanuel Macron has sought to criminalize illegal border crossings while tightening restrictions on asylum, even as far-right parties in the country call for more. But France also has a long tradition of being a sanctuary for artists, including Pablo Picasso and James Baldwin. The idea here was to give artists a place to connect with one another, to work on and exhibit their crafts and to help with all the practical challenges of living as a refugee. First of all, they helped us find a place to live. Secondly, they helped us get a work visa, find a lawyer. Some people needed psychologists, things like that. Kurdish actor and drama teacher Aram Tashtakin fled Turkey in late 2017. So why did you leave Turkey? Because it's complicated living there. I'm a conscientious objector. I'm anti-military. I'm an artist who tries to make art and theater in the Kurdish language, to protect the Kurdish language. But when we make Kurdish art or theater, they always say it's terrorist propaganda, and that really hurts. How can a language be terrorist propaganda? In 2018, graffiti artist and painter Aklam Jorban fled her native Yemen and its years-long civil war. She says she faced added persecution for her family's Somali and Ethiopian roots and for her wanting to be an artist as a woman. She left everyone and everything behind and says she still doesn't know if it was the right decision. Uh, because all of us, we are without our families, so we feel lonely, we feel um, there is a lot of problem. But when we are together, we, when we speak, when we share this story, it um, make us little stress, make us little keep fighting. Mm -hmm. So it is good to have this place. This place, though, the Agency of Artists in Exile, is experiencing its own problems. It depends on Paris's city government for free workspace and has already had to move twice. The building we visited is small and temporary, and the future is uncertain. Director Judith Dupont. To find a place now, it's a very real, concrete problem. To further make its case and showcase its artists, the agency recently presented its third annual month-long festival, titled Visions of Exile. Amid the national and even global fights over immigration, this is a small project, but those being helped think art can change the way people think. Because when they see our artwork, they, they don't see it as a refugee, they see it as artist, and artists make this thing. 
with you all this journey to be something. Do you know we have a hope and we are human before we come. We are a refugee. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown in Paris. Wonderful story. And on the NewsHour online right now, as the fires continue to rage in Australia, nonprofit groups are stepping in to help the firefighters, evacuees, and wildlife. Find out how you can support their efforts at pbs.org slash NewsHour. And that's the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. For all of us at the PBS News Hour, thank you, and we'll see you soon. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by. On a cruise with American Cruise Lines, travelers experience the maritime heritage and culture of New England. Our fleet of small cruise ships explores American landscapes, seaside villages, and historic harbors, where you can experience local customs and cuisine. American Cruise Lines, proud sponsor of PBS NewsHour. Fidelity Investments. BNSF Railway. Consumer Cellular. And by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation supporting science, technology, and improved economic performance and financial literacy in the 21st century. Supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions, This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS News Hour West. From WETA Studios in Washington and from our bureau at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University.